what really happens when two subatomic particles interact? It's, it's kind of a tough question to answer because it's not like we can actually watch the thing happen like you can watch two baseballs interact. So what we try to do is build up mathematical models of those interactions. And the standard way of approaching this problem is to develop a machinery. And the name of this machinery is called the Lagrangian. It's named after Joseph Louis Lagrange, who's a French physicist way back in the day, it had absolutely nothing to do with quantum mechanics, but he developed a technique that's very handy for quantum mechanics and quantum field theory and our methods for understanding the subatomic world. And in this technique, you have this engine, you have a, a structure where you put in the initial states, like say you want to watch two electrons interact. So you say, okay, I've got electron number one and electron number two, and they've got their energies and they've got their directions and their momenta. And then this machine follows the evolution of the electrons and all their possible interactions and then calculates sometime later in the future where the electrons will be. Pretty straightforward approach. You can see how this was a technique developed way back in the day for classical physics and then adopted into the quantum framework of the subatomic world. Not an easy calculation to do, but it's doable. But this technique was running into some big issues back in the 1960s. We had been able to use this technique to understand electromagnetic interactions like two electrons bouncing off of each other. And our theory, our quantum theory of electromagnetic interactions is called quantum electrodynamics, QED. That's what it's called. And it had great success. Everyone figured it out. Nobel Prizes, pats on the back, the whole deal. But then in the 1960s, we were starting to build really giant particle colliders, and we were trying to understand the nature of the proton and the neutron. And we were smashing them together, and we were finding out that the proton and neutron aren't fundamental. They're actually made of smaller things. And when we smash them together, we get all sorts of weird byproducts. We get pions and kaons and mesons and resonances. It was just, it was just a mess. We had no clue what was going on, and we were trying to use this machinery of the Lagrangian that had been so successful for the electromagnetic interaction to this new kind of force that we were just discovering, what we later called the strong nuclear force, but we were just figuring it out, and we couldn't do it. It was just too complicated. We couldn't write it down. We couldn't build the engine to do it. So people started looking for some other approaches. And there was one approach that was especially interesting that was developed way back in the 1940s by Werner Heisenberg. Werner Heisenberg, he's like, look, the subatomic world is crazy. We have a really hard time understanding it. We have a really hard time following interactions. It's just a mess. So why don't we skip all of it? Why don't we skip all of it? We know the state at the beginning, you know, we've got our electrons, we've got our particles, we've got our setup. And what we want is a prediction. We want to know what the, our experiment is going to record. So why don't we build a machinery instead of following along particles in time and seeing how they evolve? Why don't we just like build something that just maps input to output in just one step? It's worth a shot. This is called the S matrix theory. S stands for scattering, because this is very useful for scattering problems. Heisenberg took a crack at it. The math, as you might imagine, is kind of complex, because you're trying to encode all of these detailed interactions in just one big thing, just one that get your output. Kind of hard to do. People hated it. No one cared about it. They're like, okay, whatever, Heisenberg. And they moved on with their lives. But in the 1960s, people were getting desperate. So they revived this technique and tried to use the S-matrix theory to try to explain the strong nuclear force. 
it kind of sort of worked like they didn't have a technique that was working but there were some very interesting hints they were able to you know to wrap their heads around it they're making more and more sophisticated versions year by year and then in the 1960s as people were working on this they found that there's a certain mathematical function in the S matrix theory applied to strong nuclear force uh, that regularly repeated itself Okay, and it turned out to be useful. No one really understood why it was useful. But as people started to really dig into this S matrix theory, they're like, okay, okay. I know the whole point of Heisenberg and what he was saying was that we skip this whole time evolution stuff and where the electrons are and how long it takes them, blah, blah, blah. And we just go right to the end when one big giant leap. But we kind of like to understand things in terms of time and space, you know, whatever. So they took the techniques that were developed in S matrix, trying to understand the strong nuclear force and gave them and put them in space and time to give them a new interpretation just to see what's going on. Like to try to build some intuition of just what, what's going on. And these repeated functions turned into something else. They turned into strings. The original string theory was developed in the 1960s to try to understand the strong nuclear force. Not a bad idea, not a bad idea, but what did these strings mean? What does it mean for the strong nuclear force to be carried by strings? And is it any good at explaining the strong force? Well, I'm going to leave you at a cliffhanger. Sorry, you're gonna have to tune in next week. We are in the middle of our series where we're exploring the motivation and the history of string theory. And it starts here in the 1960s. And then uh, we'll talk about next week about how string theory, spoiler alert, totally failed to explain the strong nuclear force. But that's next week. Please consider going to patreon.com slash PM Sutter. Really, it is your contributions that keep these shows alive. And like, share, subscribe, do all the YouTube stuff, um, and start thinking about strings.